Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Nick. Good to be here. Let's start off with a warm up. And so far today, what unusual or non negotiable things have you done for your health and performance? When I woke up today, I always start the day off with my Steve Reeves breakfast shake, which is like a very high calorie shake. Um, it includes orange juice, uh, gelatin powder, milk, whole milk powder, um, a splash of maple syrup, and sometimes a banana as well. Mm. And so I think it's important to start with the high calories because in the morning, that's the time of the day, statistically of the most heart attacks. Um, and the reason why is because you just slept for eight hours without eating. So it's very high stress. So getting those calories in, switching that stress off, uh, I think is a very important strategy. So you're a fan of blunting the, the big cortisol spike that happens in the morning. Yeah, you got it. I think there's no better way to do that than with food. A little bit of red light in the morning that I think can help too, or sunshine even better. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. But how do you settle on those particular ingredients? Um, have you happened to read the book called Muscle, Smoke, and Mirrors by Randy Roach? Mm, I have not. Oh, man, I highly recommend that. It's a two-volume series, and it's the history of bodybuilding, but basically based on nutrition. Mm. So it seems like they really had nutrition figured out back in the day more before the steroid era kicked in. Yeah. And the scares of cholesterol-saturated fat kind of pushed them in the wrong direction. So bodybuilders today eat much differently than back then. And it turns out what's best for building muscle is also best for your health. Uh, based on my research, and that's because stress is catabolic. So yeah. the ideal bodybuilding, muscle building, and health building diet would be one that uh, negates all the stress as much as possible. So yeah, that's why I just wanted to try his shake, and uh, it worked out really well. I could feel the stress like melting away after. Some of the early bodybuilders were the original biohackers. They had it figured out very early on, and I like what you're saying. I'm a big proponent of muscle centric medicine, making sure your body stays in an anabolic state with periods and pulses of going catabolic. Yeah, absolutely. I, I kind of like, I don't know, this world and society kind of gives us this impression of bodybuilders are just like muscle heads are gross. But it's like back then, it's just like they were basically reading that book. I just realized they're just kind of people like us who care about their health and want it like to maximize their health. And just improve themselves as much as possible, focusing on what's most important, what you put in your body every day. Yeah. And speaking of that, people who are watching will notice that I have a blue, very blue mouth right now. And I went out for a nice two mile walk this morning and I have some methylene blue in my mouth and it's giving my teeth and tongue a very unique tint. And that will be the topic of the main topic of our conversation today. We have nitric oxide mitochondrial and metabolic medicine, methylene blue, and some breath work stuff. We got a lot to cover today. So I'd love to dive in with methylene blue, what it is. And if you were to talk to some person off the street and you wanted to convince them that it's an important thing to research and possibly with their doctor's approval put into their healthcare plan, how would you convince them? It's a tough sell in 45 seconds. But I guess I'll start off with saying I wrote the book the ultimate guide to methylene blue published it last year. I am amazed at how much this thing is selling. So it's very, very good to see. I guess I wrote a good one. Um, and uh, a lot of people are helping themselves by reading it. But as far as what methylene blue is, it is the blue dye. And it was originally developed by a German chemical company, BASF, uh, for the textile industry to dye fabrics. But soon after it was discovered by Nobel laureate, Robert Ehrlich, he published a study in like the 1890s uh, showing that it completely cured two malaria patients. So what methylene blue uh, represents was the very first pharmaceutical drug ever developed. It's completely synthetic, yet it works in ways that are physiologically rational, that makes sense. Uh, and that is that they affect the metabolism in a positive way. I know back when I started researching natural health, I came across the idea of food dyes and particularly red 40 and I forget the blue number, but the detriments those are associated with. Why is this one dye seemingly different? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I haven't looked at the specifics as to why, you know, comparing the dyes, ones that are harmful and ones that aren't. But basically, I know that methylene blue is uh, an antioxidant where I suspect the other ones are more 
oxidation, they create the oxidation that methylene blue helps to prevent. So for some reason, they're both dyes, but uh, methylene blue seems to work in the opposite way and actually promotes health. Mark, you've written some interesting books that are right at my alley, such as this one on methylene blue, which I read and was mind blown. I've read a lot of the information in different places on the internet than my own research, but you did a good job synthesizing it all into one. You've also written about red light therapy and cancer, all kinds of really fascinating topics. How did you get started? What's your backstory? Uh, well, when I was 12, my mom died of cancer. And after the trauma from that wore off, like 15 years later, I was like, I was like, I started talking about it more because I could talk about it. I was so choked up even mentioning what happened because I was just so distraught from it for many years. But I realized whenever I talked about this and told people, opened up and said I lost my mom to cancer, um, it created like the most, some of the deepest and most meaningful conversations with people and people would listen. So I'm like, I got this story I could tell. And when I say it, people are going to listen and relate and immediately create this close connection what's the greatest good i could do with that story and i was like you know what nobody's solving this cancer thing the cancer industry makes like 126 billion a year it's it's definitely more than that when i wrote the book two years ago or published it that's what it was but it, just like any business they're trying to make more and more so um, doctors are too busy in their office you know prescribing knives and pills uh, so who's going to solve this? I was like, it has to be a lay person. And I'd been researching for many years at that point. I'm like, I'm really good at this. I'm going to dive into the research. And I ended up reading like 10,000 studies or more just to find the nuggets of truth, the gold, all the threads of research that we need to know about that most people don't know about. I didn't know what I was going to find when I started. Uh, but by the end, it has almost 5,000 scientific and clinical references in the two books. The first one is called The Cancer Industry. And the second is called Cancer, the Metabolic Disease Unraveled. First, I wanted to find out um, what had been kind of on my mind and at the back of everyone's mind, but I think my whole family was too afraid to, to ask the question was, did my mom die of cancer or was it the treatments? Because as soon as she got, you know, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, it was bad. It was like no symptoms before to clearly dying now and in a lot of pain and suffering. So that was book one, the cancer industry. So it has like a chapter on surgery, chapter on chemo, chapter on radiotherapy. And if somebody went out and wanted to find everything they could find out about these uh, directly from the science and spent three years on it, they might come up with, they might come up with what I did. I'm really good at finding data. So that's what I did. I just compiled it all together. There's also a very important chapter on cancer screening tests. And so if you breathe air, as I say, you got to read this book, do it for yourself, do it for your family, because uh, by the time the doctor gives you a diagnosis with that word cancer, um, it's like, good luck thinking rationally and thinking through this one. It needs to be done now. So I wrote it for myself and for the whole world. And I hope and I'm seeing a lot of people uh, benefit from it. And then the second book, real quick, uh, Cancer, the Metabolic Disease Unraveled. I wanted to find out like. After the first book, I guess I should just tell the story here because uh, it's it's been known for over 50 years that surgery, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy kill people faster than they would have died without anything at all. And here we are 50 years later, still using it every single day in oncology centers worldwide. So it's basically murder for profit. My mom didn't die of cancer. Uh, she was murdered for profit by an industry that wants to make money rather than help people. So once I found out that truth, which I had long suspected was true, I wanted to find out, you know, what is cancer? What is happening in the body of someone with cancer? And what is the most efficient way to uh, reverse the root cause? And so that's kind of what we got down to in that book. That's a, an even bigger book than the previous one. That one itself has over 4,000 studies. And it gives you all the data to inform yourself fully on what's been studied. Because there's so many amazing scientists out there. Uh, for over the past 150 years or so that I've been doing great work on this, but you never hear about it. Yeah. Um, so it's all in there. And uh, anyone who likes information will absolutely love it. Anyone who doesn't might um, ignite a passion for truth and seeking it when they read it. Um, so that's kind of where my research began. Once I figured out what cancer was, amazingly, I realized all the other diseases, which don't really exist, all there are are symptoms, by the way. Uh, they're all the same thing, all the same situation in the body uh, for every single disease, no matter what you want to name it, is happening, which is an absolute miracle. It's incredible. 
So I was like, okay, so if this situation's happening, if we discover maybe a few really good and safe, effective medicines that work on the metabolism, then that's a really great start for my next step. So I, I wrote a book on red light, one on balneal therapy, one on methylene blue, and that's kind of where I'm at now. There's a quote from your books, and I'm sure I, I read it in meth, the methylene blue book, and I'm sure it's in others also, but you mentioned that there's 32,000 recognized diseases, but the only real disease is a malfunctioning cell. And yeah, that, you got it. And that's what you were just describing with the metabolic therapies and metabolic medicine. Yeah, for sure. And the amazing thing with that is that, I mean, it makes it unbelievably simple. It's like, okay, if there's only one disease and it's worth my time to figure out what that is and understand how it works, because then once you do that, then you're free. Then you know how to, or what's happening if something goes wrong and how to fix it. So uh, that's kind of the goal here. That's that's the goal of my work and we're making some good progress. I'm writing my next book now and it's going to be even more profound than the Methylene Blue book. I have no doubt. That's an extraordinary claim that there's 32,000 diseases and they all have the same underlying root cause. It is. Yeah, it does sound extraordinary. And they're counting on us dismissing that. You know what I mean? Um, why do 32,000 plus officially classified diseases exist? And the answer is because if you don't have an officially classified name, then you can't create a patented medicine for it. So it's like this is kind of a, an offshoot, a natural uh, Something that happens when you have a medical system that requires patented medicine. It's something we should have expected and we can kind of see it happening now. But yeah, at the end of the day, when you go to your doctor, it's because you have symptoms and then they, they look at the collection of symptoms and, and they give you some kind of name, right? So it's like the name doesn't matter. Forget the names, forget the diseases, focus on the symptoms and ask why the symptoms occur in the first place seek the truth on that and then you will you will find it it's all out there yeah well you mentioned a second ago that for the information seekers those that believe that more information is better for those that want to understand hear all the different opinions test things for themselves where it's safe and then make a decision from there that your your work is game changing and i have to agree like one of the first things i came across in your methylene blue book that made me pause and audit my own lifestyle was the role of nitric oxide. And for the bodybuilders, for people interested in fitness, those are very popular pre-workout ingredients. And in my own, I have uh, citrulline malate, I have beetroot powder and other, I consume a lot of nitric oxide precursor foods. So I'm, I'm curious if you can elaborate on that and where the health and wellness and medical industry went wrong with nitric oxide. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of where I start the book on methylene blue. Uh, basically, the idea is that you need to first understand nitric oxide and its role, uh, since it's, we've been kind of so misinformed about it uh, by society, before you can understand how meth and appreciate how methylene blue works, because methylene blue is a nitric oxide inhibitor. So there are a lot of cardiologists, some of whom have reached out to me and said, I've been prescribing, you know, nitric oxide promoting drugs for many years and i'm ready to change your your chapter on nitric oxide has convinced me otherwise um so that was really hopeful to hear actually but uh yeah so doctors medical professionals nurses i think and even yeah bodybuilders like you're saying we're all taught that nitric oxide is this glorious protective substance uh and that is because based solely on the fact that it it dilates blood vessels and it does dilate blood vessels, but the problem is that in excess, it actually does the opposite. And it turns out nitric oxide is basically released in an emergency situation when the metabolism, when the metabolism isn't working to dilate blood vessels to prevent hypoxia. Uh, so scientists tend to see, oh, you know, anything that dilates blood vessels is good because in coronary heart disease and heart attacks, uh, the blood vessels are constricted, so this must be a good thing. But they failed to see the bigger picture here. Uh, it turns out that carbon dioxide, which is produced when the metabolism is working well, basically it's thyroid glucose into the cell, into the mitochondria, and then comes out of that are water, ATP, and carbon dioxide. That's the basic formula. And so a high level of CO2, CO2 does a couple things. It does 
what nitric oxide does, but it does it better. It dilates blood vessels and it also shuttles oxygen like directly into cells. So in my book, um, Cancer the Metabolic Disease Unraveled, I talk about carboxy therapy as one of the ways that has been studied to treat cancer and various things. And that's basically the injection or even inhalation of carbogen, which is 95% oxygen or 95% air with 5% added CO2. And so adding that little bit of CO2 to a hyperbaric chamber will make it very, very good for you. But if you use like 100% oxygen, just like when doctors administer 100% oxygen, that's like one of the more popular ways that they kill people. Because what that does is pushes CO2 out of the body, inhibits your body's ability to use oxygen, which is kind of ironic because that's their goal when they're given so much O2, you'd think that would help, but it actually inhibits it. Uh, so CO2 is the primary vasodilator. Nitric oxide is very misunderstood. Uh, it's been implicated in as it's actually, there's a paper called the nitric oxide hypothesis of aging inside which the scientists present a growing body of evidence that nitric oxide is the primary mediator of aging and and damage of all tissues in the body, including the brain and heart. So to wrap things up on that, uh, unless you have any more questions. Yeah, are there different types of nitric oxide? I thought there was like an inducible INOS, ENOS, and are they like all treated the same by the body in terms of their beneficial or detrimental effects? Yeah, so INOS is like inducible nitric oxide synthase, ENOS. These are enzymes which are elevated and then they catalyze the production of nitric oxide. And yeah, there are a few of them. I haven't thought about those in too often, but what's important to note is that the INOS is the predominant one. Uh, it's by and large, it's the one you need to really focus on, but I'm pretty sure methylene blue um, inhibits all three, which is good news. So it's not like something we have to think about too much, but yeah, there are different types. The predominant one though is the INOS. And the other thing what you were saying a second ago that I want to circle back on is the role of carbon dioxide. So instead of taking these supplements in my pre-workout, since I make my own, I should just exclude them and perhaps do a few minutes of breath work, CO2 tolerance breath work beforehand as a more effective way of preparing my body for exercise. I think it'd be a lot more physiologically compatible and rational to do that. Also, um, some athletes load up on sodium bicarbonate before as well. Yeah which is like the baking soda that's under everyone's sink. That's like 99 cents for a box. Um, that stuff, it, it's basically another form of CO2. Uh, if you consume it orally, once it reaches your stomach, it's going to combine with the hydrochloric acid and it'll form CO2. So one way or the other, taking sodium bicarbonate is another pre-workout. Uh, it's a very good method for pre-workout. A little bit of red light before the workout. And I think like a, I think ideally, like during a workout, the ideal would be like an intravenous glucose to prevent stress, uh, but that's not really practical. So some kind of like sweet and salty, I think like orange juice with gelatin and a pinch of salt might be the ideal drink to drink during a workout. Uh, that's probably a pretty good way to prep. What's your take on hormetic stress? Like, is it bad to have a transient spike or say a 30, 40 minute spike in cortisol, epinephrine, like the stress hormones while I'm working out and then have an anabolic rebound with like protein and glucose or carbohydrates, those kind of like anabolic factors right afterward? That's a good question because like doing anything that's like meaningful in life is a stress, you know? So and then what do you get out of it? It's like you're sacrificing a little bit of relaxation for something great that moves you forward in life. So I've been thinking about this and the hormetic idea. I'm not even sure, to be honest. Um, it seems to me like a little bit of stress is good. That's what the whole idea behind like bodybuilding, right? Yeah. You're putting stress on the muscle and then it adapts by yeah. increasing its size, which is good for your metabolism. So, yeah, yeah, I think there's definitely some truth to that. It's been shown that... Uh, Exercise does increase testosterone. So for that temporary stress that you do put on it, there seems to be a, a very positive adaptation and rebound response hormonally and in other ways as well. All right, let's go on to methylene blue now, the supposed topic of this show. You mentioned what it was in the intro, but can you give me some more background and details about this molecule? 
It is a die. Um, but one of the reasons or one of the things that it's still used for this day and one of the first applications other than textile dyeing that it was discovered for is um, is in laboratories. So they would use it as like a laboratory stain. And it basically you put it on like a Petri dish with some cells and it kind of outlines the cell membrane and the organelles inside the cell. And that, that's used for, for like cellular microscopy. So when you're looking through a microscope, you can see and identify what you're looking at. And it's still to this day, it's considered one of the best for that. There's some copper in there, which I suspect is oh. has a lot to do with its benefit because copper is a precursor to the cytochrome C oxidase enzyme, which is like complex four of the mitochondrial respiratory chain. And so basically, if you don't have enough copper in your diet, um, you can't produce that essential enzyme, cytochrome C oxidase. And it seems to be that most people don't get enough. The RDA is way too low. Monsanto uses a pesticide that, that tends to pull the copper directly out of the soil selectively from what I've researched too. So there's like this really important balance that I've been researching lately, um, Morley Robbins book and others that uh, copper and iron. I'm not sure if you looked into this at all. Have you heard something about this at, in recent times or looked into that at all? Yeah, I've heard a little bit about copper and iron and also co the copper zinc ratio and other things like that. Yeah, so glyphosate, that's that's the Monsanto yep. pesticide I was referring to, and that pulls right out of the soil the copper. So we're basically low on copper, and then they put iron, they fortify that in a lot of the grain products. So people tend to get a lot of iron and a little bit of copper, and there's this huge imbalance caused by that, um, especially the iron. That tends to catalyze lipid peroxidation of like polyunsaturated fats which is why I donate blood every two, three months. Yeah. yeah, I suspect the copper and the methylene blue because it's kind of a, a bit of a copper supplement. Uh, that's one of the reasons, like biochemically, why it's very beneficial. Mm. But other than that, it's still kind of a mystery to me and maybe to everyone how, why it works so well. Yeah. Can you outline some of the properties and like how it works and what it does, like what it's most notable for? I, you mentioned antioxidant. I know there's like anti pathogenic antimicrobial properties there's like mitochondrial protection which is also related to antioxidant but continue yeah absolutely so i said it's a mystery like why it works but we know how it works we know exactly how it works this is very well identified so uh essentially i'm not sure if you talk about this much on your show but the idea that you know mitochondria and their well-functioning is the key to health. A high level of energy production in the body is the key to health. And uh, if you look at like a puppy or a child, they're just like bursting with energy, running around the room. That is the epitome of health. That's what we're looking for. And if you feel that way, that's a good sign. And methylene blue tends to be a really good way to restore mitochondrial function when it's impaired. And I like to keep things as simple as possible. And so in the mitochondrial respiratory chain, which is the process inside every one of your cells of the conversion of the food that you eat into the energy needed to power every cell and every process in your body, uh, there are four complexes in the mitochondrial respiratory chain, and they all are dependent on enzymes. And so basically repairing somebody's damaged mitochondrial health is kind of a matter of seeing where the where a break in that chain exists, and then giving some food or other uh, intervention to repair that. But it turns out with methylene blue, it doesn't matter because every single complex is one, two, three, and four. Um, methylene blue can function as the missing enzyme. So this is why it's so incredible because it helps your body restore metabolic function, improve uh, ATP and CO2 production. And then it's like this vicious circle uh, for a lack of a better term, because it's a really good thing um, of improvement in your metabolic function that tends to last too. It's like we can lose our health very quickly. The metabolic function can kind of go down very quickly and it produces things that keep it down further. And then, but if you fix it, it can very quickly improve and kind of be self-sustaining. So it's very exciting. We can heal quickly and methylene blue seems to be one of the best possible ways to do that. So if I understand this correctly, one of the core tenets of mitochondrial or metabolic medicine is that all the diseases originate when the body lacks sufficient power and that 
occurs because of problems with the mitochondria. And what's so special about methylene blue is that no matter where along that process, the energy generation process, there's an issue, it's able to insert itself and restore proper functionality. Yeah, very well said. Okay. So what are some of the like, other things, the benefits people see when they start using it, if they start using it? Uh, well, I've had a lot of people reach out. I'm kind of collecting testimonials now. And uh, eventually, I'm, I might insert them into a new chapter in the book. I did that in the uh, the red light therapy book. Just kind of collected a bunch and added them in. I don't know. Maybe I'll read one for you now. Miriam said, I've tried methylene blue for two days now. I can tell you it works a gazillion times better than Adderall. I've taken medicine for ADD for almost 20 years. Three drops in steady, calm energy, concentration, and calmness throughout my entire day. Three drops, she wrote again in caps to emphasize. And that's a very low dose. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the most amazing things about it. Like three milligrams is unbelievably low or three drops is actually 1.5 milligrams. So that not only makes it cheaper to take, it's already inexpensive and that makes it even less. It also makes it safer because of the, yeah. the small amount you're taking. It's like the chances of anything happening there yeah. are unbelievably low. That's actually the same reason I came across it when I was doing my research. I love to study and wear safe, test the most researched nootropics and things that seem to have high upside potential and minimal risk. And I came across methylene blue, and it seems like it's one of those included in a popular nootropic product called Troscriptions, along with uh, a bunch of other things that help balance it out. But that's why I came across it for like the, the clarity it offers, the energy, the, I guess if you have brain fog, it can help alleviate that. But that's the whole other realm that we didn't even discuss. Interesting. Yeah. So it's like, it seems like the FDA doesn't want us to have methylene blue. Yeah. So it's great. If, and it's probably helping people. And then the other thing that I came across in your book, which, which I was completely unaware of, is that it has a, a role in the NAD like, production cycle, because we hear about nicotinamide riboside NR and nicotinamide mononucleotide NMN, and all these other NAD boosting like, supplements. And I had no idea that methylene blue has a role in the NAD production as well. Mm -hmm. I tried to dig a little deeper in that. I'm always trying to add a little bit more every single book. Um, so NAD is, it's used in like the Krebs cycle, which is like, I guess I call it like phase two of three phases involved in energy production in cells. And um, yeah, it tends to be a pretty accurate biomarker of metabolic health. So sometimes it's measured to diagnose disease. And I think that's a really uh, rational scientific way of diagnosing disease because as life goes on, as the metabolism slows in direct proportion to that, the NAD to the NADH ratio seems to decrease. And methylene blue being something that increases mitochondrial biogenesis, like multiplies the number of mitochondria in your cells, uh, which like exercise does too. Um, it also increases the NAD to the NADH ratio as well. So very, very effective in many different ways. And it's fun to outline all the ways that it can help. Does it have role as an ergogenic, like athletic performance enhancing aid? Like, Would it help if I take it pre-workout? Well, for its ability to improve glucose use by cells, yeah, I definitely think so. Um, I've, I think I looked it up though. I, I looked up research on that to see if methylene blue could help. And at least at the time, uh, I couldn't find any, maybe some does exist. Uh, but yeah, just based on what it does for the body, um, keeps the, the energy production high and importantly, the CO2 production high, which I guess one of the issues with exercise, especially prolonged exercise is lactic acid production. Um, that's heavily involved in like cancer formation and um, angiogenesis because it creates like this hypoxic condition. Um, so CO2 inhibits lactate production, which is probably the most important thing. Bodybuilders, they actually talk about like, you know, the pump and they love that, how their muscles get inflated and it does feel good. It looks good, but that's actually lactic acid production. So there's a lot of negative things about that. Um, that having a high running metabolism or taking sodium bicarbonate, which mimics having a high running metabolism uh, can inhibit. So yeah, I definitely think methylene blue would be a really good thing to prevent stress, 
and help improve athletic performance. Oh, yes. Yeah, stress prevention. That's another another use case for it. And I think I also read that it's a neuroprotectant. Yeah, one interesting thing that I think it was Robert Ehrlich determined is that methylene blue tends to accumulate in the brain, uh, which is an amazing thing uh, because our brains use a lot of energy. And so if the metabolism's off, there are going to be some significant issues. They need a lot of energy to function properly, basically. So the fact that methylene blue is something that promotes a high level of energy production goes right to where it's needed most as a really good thing. And that's why it's been shown in recent years, like the research is really taking off for methylene blue as like a nootropic uh, for reducing depression, but also for things like dementia. So Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, I go over those in the book and even autism as well. It's been studied for, which has been shown increasingly to be a metabolic disease as well which is methylene blue's specialty. So it's for its ability to switch back on uh, oxidative energy production and also to function as an antioxidant uh, it is very definitely very protective and restorative for the brain. Because of cytochrome C oxidase, if I take methylene blue and I go into the sun, will that have a more beneficial outcome than if I didn't? Yeah, and I think the only thing better would be to go to the Dead Sea, take methylene blue, and then float on that super saline water, which is basically magnesium chloride, and then with the sun beaming down on you. Oh, yeah. and that's actually called balneophotodynamic therapy, one of the longest words I've heard today. I love it. Yeah, so all three will definitely synergize. Um, red light works on the cytochrome C oxidase, the uh, complex four of the mitochondria. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to have any effect on one to three though, which methylene blue does, which is why I was just so blown away by that. And I guess why so many people are, uh, and now you can see why they would synergize together. They both act in approximately the same way. So your experience using methylene blue with phototherapy, whether that's natural sunlight or that's red light, what do you think? Like, do you know how it works and why it's more effective than doing either by themselves? Yeah, so it's because of the fact that red light and near infrared light tend to uh, be absorbed by the cytochrome C oxidase enzyme, which tends to get inhibited, by the way, by nitric oxide. Yeah. So it's like that's one of the, the probably my main reason why nitric oxide is not good for you. It inhibits cytochrome C oxidase. Find me any research, any scientist will, that will say that's a good thing. And I'll be surprised because it's not. It shuts off energy production very well, like a switch. So both red light and methylene blue are the two, the only two known um, substances or therapeutic interventions that I know of that can actually photo dissociate. And in the case of methylene blue, dissociate the nitric oxide from that specific enzyme. And then it upregulates its activity. So by taking both together, you're getting something taken that's flowing through your bloodstream they can do that. And it's affecting all the cells along the ways from your esophagus to your stomach, small intestine and everything in the blood and your veins. Uh, and then also, of course the red light and the near infrared light, they can penetrate many inches deep into the body. So that's amazing. You know, for 100% that that's pure, there's no excipients, unlike taking some oral supplements, which is one of the huge advantages. Yeah. It's a non-invasive procedure. So I think just to combine both of them, that you're they're working in very similar ways, and it just seems to really synergize. And the research is is showing that these days. Mm -hmm. What about methylene blue and memory? That seems like there's something there. Uh, yeah. So there have been some studies on memory. Uh, I don't remember them specifically though, so I don't even want to try because I, I like to be precise. This is why I like to write books rather than be on podcasts. Yeah, yeah. But I'm here anyways. It's enough to mention that it does have an effect on improving memory yeah many different parameters um from like recollection of memory and the speed at, at which you can recall different things hmm. um, so yeah there have been some studies on that they're all in the book anyone who's really interested in that it's in perfect detail there with the studies referenced yeah and i think it also has like from what i remember i could be wrong but it has an effect on certain neurotransmitters like acetylcholine esterase the enzyme that breaks down the neurotransmitter of learning and memory, as it's often called, acetylcholine, and then also monoamine oxidase. Yes, 
monoamine oxidase, whatever the acronym is, it is for it. Um, methylene blue in low doses actually inhibits that. Interestingly, though, in very high doses, it actually promotes it. But it's nothing to worry about because what is considered a very high dose to do that is enormous. And you would never take that much. Your whole head would be blue. Uh, the amount that's necessary that, that seems to be required and optimal is very, very little. Uh, but yeah, in, in those doses, it does inhibit that. And then acetylcholinesterase. Um, for things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, the mainstream theory is that it's a lack of acetylcholine but it's actually the exact opposite uh -huh. and uh methylene blue having like an interesting life reduction of stress seems to break down the acetylcholine mm. which is what we're actually trying to do and methylene blue does assist in that i've got a very big section on that in the book yeah. under the alzheimer's and dementia section and what about serotonin and norepinephrine does it impact those neurotransmitters I don't know if I've looked at that in particular, but what we're told about serotonin is not true. I've got a section in the book on depression, and the mainstream theory is that uh, you know depression is caused by a lack of serotonin. But it's funny when I was researching the book for this, like even in the scientific literature, like published scientists are calling that theory the serotonin hypothesis, which is what it's called. They call that a conspiracy theory to sell uh, SSRI drugs to a gullible public. There was just a huge meta-analysis that came out that also was debunking, I think it was this exact thing, the serotonin theory, and then also there was another one that came out about Alzheimer's and beta amyloid and all these things. A lot of interesting research coming out debunking a lot of the old established hypotheses. Ah, wow, very good. Only problem is we'll never hear about them. <laughs> but if for those who seek, uh, and they will find it and they will benefit. It's like we really, really uh, are rewarded for our efforts when we seek truth in this life, it seems. And watching a podcast like yours is definitely one great way to do that. But yeah, as far as serotonin goes, um, things like stinging nettle, poison ivy, bumblebees, when they sting you, they use serotonin. And that's what's causing like the pain when wow. you get stung by these. And that reaction, the inflammatory reaction. Mm. So that says pretty much all you need to know about serotonin and why increasing it's probably not a good thing. And as far as methylene blue goes, I haven't looked specifically. There's probably some studies on this, though, but I suspect I would search up um, the enzyme that catalyzes the production of serotonin from tryptophan. And I'm guessing you will find that it inhibits that. The last and what I viewed as the most interesting, unexpected use of methylene blue is around fears and traumas, PTSD, uh, phobias. It seems to have this like psychological effect that helps people work through things that have become a negative like biological stimulus yeah there are like entire industries like growing around the idea of wanting to like eliminate past traumas and things and so many different ways from like eft tapping yeah. to like acupuncture and everything to do with your energy meridians to try to get rid of these old post-traumatic stress emotions that are just trapped inside of us and so I've really got to hand it to the scientists that thought of this. What a creative study and an important one. Um, so, yeah, I don't have all the details on this. The book definitely does. But there's been studies using methylene blue on like fear extinction, where they took human volunteers and the participants, like half of them got methylene blue, half didn't. And they put them in like very small containers. They were all claustrophobic. And then they like assessed their level of fear based on the claustrophobia from the confined space. And then they came back again and they assessed again to see if that methylene blue did anything since it was in their system during the fear and the situation, was that at all extinguished the next time? A wild hypothesis. It's amazing that that worked because in some cases it did indeed. But in the preliminary study, like it wasn't as clean cut as you you might hope for because it turns out the people that had really uh extreme responses the first time it in some of them it was worse the next time but in the ones that were kind of in between their their fear extinction was increased by the methylene blue their fear was reduced that is to say it was extinguished by the drug hmm. so it was kind of um 
it helped some people. It made it a little bit worse for some people. But that line of research continues on. And the next one that I found was a little more hopeful. And it did tend to extinguish fear of more people. So, yeah, that, that uh, line of research continues. And it's very hopeful, which is great because I think if there's one thing that this world's great at, it's like traumatizing us in so many different ways. So that's something we need, some kind of emotional regulation. And I also recommend shining a red light, putting it directly against your forehead, getting the brain cells, especially the hippocampal area, or just laying out in the sun more. Most people don't do that enough. Yeah. So one of my audience asked if you can just use a full body panel and just put it closer, like focus on your head, or you need a special targeted one to concentrate and apply it directly to your forehead like that. I've seen ones that you can like wrap around your head or your waist for weight loss, which is really convenient. But when I've looked at them, it took a long time to find out the wattage on these things. It's like they don't advertise it. And it's because it's such a low wattage. Yeah. So a full body panel can be like a thousand watts, yeah. 600 watts to a thousand. Um, and these small ones sometimes are like eight. They can be as low as eight milliwatts, like the helmet devices oh. as well which is like eight one thousandths of a single watt. Yeah. So compare that to even like a 20 watt device and you're getting like so much more. It's unbelievable. Oh, good. So, so yeah, the ones that wrap around head are pretty good, but yeah, any kind of panel you have, especially if it's higher wattage yeah. is going to do very well. The most important thing is you put it directly against mm. the body part you want to treat because that wastes less photons and it also penetrates more deeply. Gotcha. Let's go on to how you outlined, theoretically, not for humans, of course, but for research, how you would use methylene blue. This is just incredible as well. A number of studies have shown that as low as like a 10 milligram dose might be the ideal for all conditions, regardless of body size or anything like that, which is a very small dose. We're talking 20 drops of a 1% methylene blue solution in water and uh, it turns out that that dose just from a practical standpoint i've been working with a hundred people or hundreds of people over the past year who have been experimenting on themselves um, using methylene blue and like reporting the results um, a 10 milligram dose seems to be best too because when you put that in i recommend orange juice and mix it up and drink it it doesn't dye your teeth or mouth very much mm -hmm relative to a much higher dose, which definitely would become more of an issue. So it's like, not only is it a small dose, which is safer, it's cheaper, but it's also less of a problem as far as dying your mouth if you got to go into, out into public after. So for a number of conditions, yeah, they're thinking that 10 milligrams might be the ideal. So I always recommend that that's what people start off with. And interestingly, I must mention, this is also from working with hundreds of people. I might be one of the few people in the world who know this because of that fact it's that some people do experience symptoms at the beginning and they write in and wonder why sometimes it's a headache sometimes they feel drunk and maybe a few other very minor symptoms but not pleasant and it's like why is this happening if this is such a good medicine right well one of the things happening is this is your body dumping the nitric oxide from your tissues into your bloodstream so there's kind of like a temporary poisoning happening there but ultimately, it's a really good thing because once that nitric oxide is gone, then your metabolism is going to be higher. So if there are symptoms with that 10 milligram dose, that's it's under, important to understand that that's what's happening. And the way around that, you could not take some for a few days, although the methylene blue is protective as well. So I think it's probably good to continue, but, you know, maybe half the dose and give that a shot. And the thing is, it doesn't take too long before the, the nitric oxide is out of the body and the symptoms permanently subside. Um, if that if you do get symptoms, you really needed the medicine and it's doing a lot of good. Just hang on there, half your dose and uh, continue. That's that's kind of what I've been saying and it seems to be working really well. Yeah, I found that interesting that it's a link that I failed to draw previously that the more you increase nitric oxide, the lower your metabolism. Yeah, it seems to inhibit it in a number of ways. Um, simply by shifting off the cytochrome oxidase enzyme like that, uh, there are a number of other things that happen, and it seems to be like stress and all the inflammatory mediators are all elevated as well. 
So it's overall, it's really not a good thing. So getting that down and out of the system, uh, it's a very, very good thing. And it says a lot about nitric oxide as well. Is it an anti-inflammatory? Um, yeah, I think I found some studies that showed that hmm. and that are referenced in the book as well. What about when you use it? I know that the first time I got it, I didn't realize how powerful this stuff is in terms of what it looks like and the staining ability. So I spilled a couple drops. I just thought nothing of it. I wiped it up and I turned the whole counter blue. <laughs> and <laughs> since then, I've been looking for other ways. And I was wondering if sublingual under the tongue is better absorbed, more effective, or if you can put it in like a capsule or something to prevent the mouth staining. You mentioned putting it in orange juice is one option to reduce that. Maybe like, have you heard of people using it in suppositories or something like that to target a different section of the, the body? <sighs> Uh, yeah, there have been a lot of people who don't like the staining effect, so they've been trying to figure out different ways. So I've heard a, a bunch of them over the, the past year or so. And yeah, so personally, the way I take it now is in a capsule. Mm. So I bought some gelatin capsules, 100% gelatin. I'm not getting any weird things in there, just some protein. Um, but I did notice I wanted to like do that for the whole day. So I filled some caps. I think you can get like eight milligrams, like 16 drops in there or so, which is decent. I wanted to get a bit more, but. But if you fill it up, the capsule will start dissolving in a number of minutes. Yes. So just take note of that or you'll have a blue countertop like me. <laughs> I definitely have some stains on mine too from that. Yeah. Um, what else? I've Some people say like drinking out of a straw works because mm. it kind of bypasses the teeth. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I haven't tried that myself too much, but that's one way. Um, sublingual, I've never tried myself. I've never heard anyone do that. The only downside with that would be the fact that you can only do a couple of drops or it's just going to yeah. stain your whole mouth, I think. But I've heard like gum tissue. I know this progesterone, like Ray Pete's Progest E that I sometimes take when I can't sleep. Um, rub it on the gums is what he recommends. And I think there is like a direct link to the bloodstream there. So sublingually might be a similar situation, the gum tissues. Uh, so that's probably a good thing. Mm. And the sublingual, despite its uh, limitation on how much you can take. And then as a suppository, I've never seen a product like that. I guess you could put it in a capsule and that would probably work. And I think there'd be some benefits to that. I don't know how deep the medicine would go, but the colon seems to be the site of endotoxin production for the most part. And so the fact that methylene blue is like antibacterial, antifungal, that could definitely come in handy, uh, keeping bacteria levels down and thus the production and conversion of undigestible starches in the diet into a poison known as endotoxin that will prevent that. It's a fairly potent antimicrobial though. So I wonder if that would have like a discriminant effect on the colon, like the microbiome in, in the colon, or if it would just kill a lot, like a, like a broad spectrum kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. It's been studied, and when I researched it, I was just looking up to find different strains of bacteria and their effect, methylene blue's effect on them. And it, I didn't see any that it wasn't antibacterial towards. So I think it probably just wipes out the entire population, yeah. which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing. Anytime there's an industry making billions of dollars, like the one selling like $20 bottles of yogurt, I think we need to uh, question whether that the hypothesis upon which their sales are based is true. And at the end of the day, I'm not convinced that um, there are good and bad bacteria. I think one's, uh, I think it all depends on what you eat, but if you eat the wrong things, it will get produced. It will get converted into some highly toxic things. Mm -hmm. Speaking of toxicity, what is the safety profile like for methylene blue? Can I have like one drop and then titrate up to maybe 10, 20 drops and see how that works? Or is there going to be an upper limit that I want to be wary of? Say I'm taking a medication or I'm sensitive. How do you go about that? Whenever someone like writes in and says, I'm taking this medication, you know, will there be any interaction with methylene blue? I'm always like, Ooh, I don't want to mess with those ones. But I just say, Hey, for first of all, of course, as my disclaimer says, well, it's not medical advice. Please don't confuse it for that. Yeah. Um, but I always say, you know, I don't think, and this is, has always been true is I don't think there's been any specific studies on interactions between that specific drug and methylene blue. Uh, but then I'm always like, you know, if I was in your situation, I would do this and Usually, if it's like an SSRI or something, 
they're kind of working in opposite ways. So I said I probably wouldn't take it methylene blue at the same time. Um, what else? Yeah, I'm kind of careful with these things, but it's I think it's important to not take two things that are doing exact opposite things in the body physiologically. So I agree. But I guess the more of the, the point here is what's the safety profile like for it? Say you're not taking medication, like you're just an average person who's not taking medication and they just want to start, they want to start small and work up. Like, are they going to be safe or is it just like a risky research chemical in, in that way? Yeah, fair enough. So I have a chapter on safety and dose specifically the part on safety. Um, I wanted to find out, you know, what's a safe amount to take. And so what you, what I looked for was like clinical trials on humans uh, and what did they use and what were the side effects, if any, and what appears to be safe is as much as 2.0 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So anywhere between 0.5 to 2.0 milligrams per kilogram, that's kind of like your upper limit there. That being said, I had a woman reach out recently who thought her son overdosed. He couldn't sleep one night. He grabbed a bottle of methylene blue and it was almost full and he drank the whole thing. And she was really worried. She's like, oh no, is he going to be okay? Should I go to the hospital? And uh, very interesting outcome what happened here. So <clears throat> one bottle, one ounce of methylene blue, that has 28 milliliters, I believe, per ounce. And in each milliliter, that's like 20 drops. One dropper full is 10 milligrams. So therefore, in one ounce, that's 280 milligrams. And let's say someone's 100 kilograms. Um, two milligrams per kilogram, which is the upper limit of the safe dose, would be 200 milligram dose at a time. And this is actually what they administer via IV at, routinely at hospitals when someone's poisoned with like a mushroom or bitten by a snake. Um, also sodium bicarbonate and activated charcoal, by the way, two very inexpensive and natural things. Yeah. And methylene blue is also used for that, but they use it for intravenously at, I think two milligrams per kilogram. So it's like, they understand that they've, Somebody has looked at the research and determined that as well. Um, so that is, I would say, the upper limit. And a lot of people out there, when I was researching for the book to see how much was a good amount to take, you know, they would they would recommend that. But it's really not practical. That's an unbelievable amount, especially if you're going to put it in a drink or something. Your mouth will be blue for like a few days. And that's why I was so happy to find out that many studies were showing that like as little as ten milligrams. And Ray Pete says. Just a few milligrams is probably enough to get the nitric oxide inhibiting effect. But 10 milligrams might be, you know, the ideal amount. So no need to take like 200 milligrams or 280 like that lady's son. Um, and I, I'll tell you the end of that story, too, by the way. Um, so he ended up drinking that. She wrote in. She said, you know, is he going to be OK? And I just told her what I told you, that that is just a little bit more than the upper limit of what's safe. So it's like, oh, he might get some negative symptoms but if i had to guess i would say he's probably going to be a lot better off his body will metabolize that quickly and get rid of it so yeah. if you don't notice any negative effects within the next 12 hours or so uh he's going to be more than fine and she wrote back and she said you were you were right he's definitely much much better off now <laughs> like she noticed a lot of his symptoms went away wow that's a great way to start with it actually if you can handle downing that much yeah. just a massive dose you're just a huge boost to help your body take care of the things it's been struggling to for so many years. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things when I was researching it originally, I was looking at the doses used in a lot of the research and I came across, like you were saying, two milligrams per kilogram. And that would put me at about 200 milligrams. And I look at a bottle, I'm like, well, I don't want to use an entire bottle every time I want to get a dose of methylene blue. That seems ridiculous. So I was happy to find that a smaller dose, according to you and Ray Pete and others, might have a lot of the similar effects of a larger dose. Yeah, absolutely. And the studies that, that suggested that 10 milligrams and one said 16 milligrams might be better, they hypothesized after that. Mm. Uh, but they found basically in that study that 10, like one group got 300 milligrams and one got 10. And they found that the one that got 300 had no additional benefits over the, the cohort that just got 10. So that's really impressive. It makes it less expensive and just way more practical. So it, we couldn't have hoped for anything better yeah. as far as people who are looking to heal and not spend a million dollars and dye their whole body blue. 
This is one of those ingredients that I feel like should go in every household's first aid kit, because as you just mentioned, it's been used in hospitals via IV effectively for treating poisonings, along with uh, NAC, activated charcoal, and sodium bicarb, and a bunch of other things to like help protect the body from whatever it is and to offset like the metabolic dysregulation that can cause. It's been used in medicine for so long, and it also has like accepted uses outside of like, self-experimentation. Add some credibility to it. Yeah, absolutely. And there was one study I remember reading. It was talking about the UN recommended that hospitals from many different countries stockpile methylene blue because of how important it is. In fact, the UN put it on their list of the top 50 list of essential medicines. So very important medicine. And it's uh, useful to stockpile. Actually, oh, speaking of that, some people might be wondering like, oh, I want to buy a whole bunch then. But what about the expiries? Is this ever going to go bad? And I spoke to an unnamed lead chemist. So he doesn't take responsibility for it. But he said, between me and you, he said, like, methylene blue is very stable. As long as it stays out of the light, it will last pretty much indefinitely, despite the, I think, five-year expiry date on the bottle. They have to kind of do that. But yeah, as far as it, it will pretty much last forever is what he's saying, which is amazing. Have you heard of people stacking it with other ingredients for the brain cognition improving effects like say caffeine or nicotine or other things like that uh no but i've heard and i've read a little bit of research on nicotine which is kind of surprising to a lot of people eh? but uh, i think there's a reason why people reach for cigarettes and they feel better when they take them and i think they feel better not because they're inhaling you know radioactive fertilizer residue it's because something's boosting uh their metabolism at the same time and i think it's you know the nicotine uh, but as far as like stacking it with nicotine and caffeine, I think it'd be a good idea, but I haven't heard of anyone in particular doing that. Uh, I personally, I got my daily stack. Well, mostly daily stack. Uh, I take like desiccated thyroid, a um, little bit of methylene blue. Right now I have, I'm kind of trying something and this is like the experimental and that would be like green tea extract to chelate some iron. And I think inositol hexaphosphate, it's another iron G later. So a couple of things to remove the iron when mm -hmm. it's highest in the morning during stress. And I also take that as like a defensive compound when I'm eating uh, like a muscle meat, which is higher in iron. Ah, uh, that makes sense. To in inhibit some of its absorption. Apparently the uh, aspirin will inhibit tryptophan absorption, mm -hmm. which gets converted to serotonin. So there's another strategy. And it also, I think, prevents iron absorption. Mm -hmm. It's like many, and also, after dinner, I sometimes make like a homemade hot chocolate made with milk and cocoa powder, both of which inhibit iron absorption. So it's like all these things I'm kind of strategizing together to make the downsides of certain foods uh, less prominent. So a lot of your ideas are controversial, and I love that because you back it up with research and there's the hyperlinks to all of that in your books and on your website and everything. So that's great. And you've mentioned one name throughout this conversation more than any other, and that would be Dr. Ray Pete. How did you find him? Who is he? And why do you like his work? I love Dr. Ray Pete. I, uh, I first heard about him from a friend who is an osteopath. And she, at the time, she was doing the ogenous von der Planets kind of diet. Uh, and if anyone doesn't know him, he's basically it's like a raw meat, honey and butter diet eater and he we eat like unripe bananas too which i don't think is a good thing but uh, but my friend who was trying his diet for a while kind of she kind of came out of that and learned about ray pete and then she told me about ray pete and i started reading his work and i'm like this is profound i love it because the way he thinks he doesn't just make things up like some so many people out there do if he says something it, there is like a reason why somebody observed this which doesn't mean it's true but if we want to solve problems solve health issues that's the method that the approach we must take the scientific method observe test and repeat so that's what ray pete seems to be all about and yeah his ideas they're always controversial as well but i think they're like he's likely correct about a lot of them and he's been talking about these things which are just gaining popularity now for like decades and decades where do you find his work ah raypete.com He's got a lot of amazing articles. I recommend if you've never heard of him or you've never been exposed to his work, that would be the place to go. 
and just check out his articles, read an article. You'll, you'll realize quickly, like this guy is the real deal. He, yeah. he comes from like a, a biology background. So it's um, very sound scientifically. And, and you can see throughout his work, how humble he is and subjective, which is exactly what you want with a scientist, uh, as opposed to some of the, the stuff that's called science in, in modern days where like they get angry at you if you say something different that, that's not science that's something else yeah. but ray pete is the real deal and i want to keep his work alive if you don't keep yeah. talking about the things yeah. like we need a new generation of people talking about it and we, we're getting it like shows like yours and uh, the work that i'm doing and different methods we are keeping this stuff alive and that's kind of what my work is based on i don't believe pete i don't think we should believe anyone that's the whole yes. point of my work look at the data inform yourself and then only then, once you're informed on a, a whole bunch of issues, then you can kind of think for yourself and come to your own conclusions. And that's, I've kind of re reverse engineered Pete's work. It's like, okay, he thinks cancer cannot exist unless there are polyunsaturated fats in the diet. What makes him think that? So I go through his articles, find the studies, read it, find more studies on different sites on saying similar things and, and different things. And yeah, so I don't believe Pete, but automatically like a religion that's a horrible thing to do and he would hate me for that too i hope because that's unscientific yeah. but uh i reverse engineered his things and it looks to me like there's really good reasons for everything he says and so the likelihood he's right about many things if not all is very high i would say yeah well mark we've been going for a long time now and i have so many other things i want to talk to you about including your research process that you were just alluding to it seems like you have a really well-oiled system that I want to learn more about. And perhaps when your next book is out there, we can reconvene and do a round two. But for now, how can listeners find you if they want to pick up your book or check out your work, connect with you online? Yeah, so all my books are, they're on fire right now, by the way. They're all number one bestsellers on Amazon. They have like the little badge underneath and everything. So uh, I'm very thankful for that. And there's a reason why they're bestsellers. It's not because I'm like a good marketer. In fact, Amazon won't let me advertise these books anymore for some reason. Uh, but if you want to get a hold of these books, I highly recommend it. Um, endalldisease.com is my website. If you want to go right to the books page, endalldisease.com slash books. But yeah, they're all there with direct links to Amazon. Okay. And are you on any of the social media platforms? No. God, no. I got rid of those in like 2015. And at first I was like, this is uncharted territory. I, you have to have social media to succeed, don't you? And uh, I was like, maybe not. So I gave it a shot and never looked back. And turns out I didn't need it. I'm so controversial. People are kind of afraid to post anyways. So yeah, you'll, you'll get shadow banned anyway. So what's the point? Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, now we'll go on to one last question before we do a quick rapid fire round and call it a day. If there is a burning of the books and all information on earth is lost, you get to save the works of three teachers. Who would you choose and why? As far as like health research and things like that go, um, I would say Randy Roach's books, which I mentioned earlier, uh, Muscle, Smoke and Mirrors. Those are incredible. I, I just finished part one, so I'm working on two now. Uh, and the second resource I would save is Ray Pete's article page, which I mentioned as well rainpeat.com slash articles. There is unbelievable amount of information in there that I need to regurgitate in my own way into books and things. And then the third thing, the third thing I would say, I'd say it would be my books. I wrote them because they needed to be written. All this data needs to be put in one place where people can find it. So uh, yeah, so I would keep all my books as well. That'd be the third one. Perfect. Nice and simple. Love it. We'll do a rapid fire round now. What areas of your own health and performance are you currently working on? Uh, for me, it's getting to bed at a decent time. I've always kind of stared at a screen late at night, and that's just kind of inhibited my sleep. And it's kind of like a vicious circle because you end up being tired and sleeping in, and then you sleep in and you can't sleep next night. So I'm still on like a treadmill with that, but I'm trying to work my way through. Uh -huh. That's probably the biggest thing for me. Every Other than that, I think I got a lot of things going well. I'm building my own Earthship house with my bare hands by myself and this hard physical labor I realize is what's been missing from my life. So ah. those, that's kind of all the things are falling into place, just to sleep. I'm going to get that going more. What one topic are you most interested in and in researching these days? Uh, right now I'm interested in researching PUFA, which is what I am researching for my next book, which is the polyunsaturated fats rapid fire. So I guess I won't say much more than that. Yeah. 
I call those the, the kryptonites. I try and eradicate them from every house I visit, but that's another topic <laughs> for a later conversation. What is one thing that your tribe does not know about you? I would say that I'm building an Earthship house. And if you haven't heard of that, it's a, a house. And the primary building component are used tires, which all the tire shops in town absolutely loved me. Wow. They, they're so happy to get rid of those because they struggle to get rid of them these days. And basically, you ram with a sledgehammer uh, a tire with about three, 400 pounds of dirt. And that tire becomes a 400 pound steel belted brick. So it's like fireproof or earthquake proof. And most importantly, the front face of the large rectangular house, um, three of your walls, your tire walls stack 10 feet high. And then the front face is all glass for like a hundred feet. So I'm going to grow oranges and bananas inside. And then the winter sun on the perfect angle of the glass, perpendicular to the winter sun, see for maximum solar gain, the sun comes Dang. in, the thick tire walls, the mass absorbs the energy and releases it when you need it. So this is the most amazing part. No matter what's happening outside, even if it's minus 40, it is 65, 70 degrees inside year round. No heating or cooling. That is so cool. I will have to look that up and put a link to that in the show notes. Well, Mark, how would you like to land this plane and leave listeners with any final thoughts? I'll give you my top three things you can do to improve your health. Uh, one, cook only with Coconut oil and butter, these are the most highest saturated fats with the least amount of polyunsaturated fats in all of nature. And in short, saturated fats are safe. The polyunsaturated are incredibly toxic, and it's the cause of all your health issues. The reason why red light and methylene blue work so well is because they protect against these fats, mm. to put that into perspective. And number two thing you can do to improve your health is eat beef instead of chicken and pork. <clears throat> because of the fact that pork and chicken don't have a rumen like a cow, which saturates the fats from the foods they eat. Um, beef has beef fat has like 4% polyunsaturated fats. Chicken and pork can have like 30 or more percent polyunsaturated fats. Yeah. So that's a huge move in the right direction. And then number three, donate blood every few months, get rid of some iron, because that's kind of what catalyzes, catalyzes the lipid peroxidation of the polyunsaturated fats in the body. And with age, increasingly, we tend to have too much iron. So getting rid of some of that, you can save like four lives, I think, per infusion, but it also will save your own life. So that's a win, 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 win. That's what we like to hear. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. I've had fun on this conversation. I can't wait to talk more about PUFAs and what you're up to in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. And thanks for listening, anyone out there. I'm Nick Urban, here with Mark Sloan, signing out from mindbodypeak.com. Have a great week and be an outlier. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, the information in this video is for information purposes only. Please